G'day, Ghoul Kings. It is your coach back here from the dead. I'm a little bit sick, but that will not stop me in my grand delusion that is fleshy to courts. What on earth is going on and why am I talking fleshy to courts? There's no new battle tome. There's no new models. Well, there kind of technically is, but there was an update in the uh, expansion book, the Harbringers book. And funnily enough, uh, I didn't quite talk about it because I didn't want to do it in my preview. I actually wanted to get some guests in and talk a little bit a bit more about the War Scrolls. But Flesh Eater Courts got some War Scroll changes. So I'm here with the abhorrent Ghoul King himself, one of Usharan's greatest uh, generals, uh, someone who was locked in the little cage with him uh, when Nagash, when Nagash, was, you know, st stuck you there and then Sigma set you free. Uh, I'm here with Josh Glenn and we're talking feck and it's a little different because it's not a new book. There's no new grand strategies and battle tactics and it's not the big refresh, though hopefully it comes soon. Um, we're going to talk specifically about your new war scroll, the uh, Marrow Scroll Herald, uh, and the changes that came with a bunch of your scrolls and kind of understand how this all works. What does it look like? Is it a good change? And what'd you lose? But before we get into that, Josh, Mr. Grumpy himself, say good day and introduce yourself. Hi, guys. Um, so, you know, Josh, uh, Grumpy, as far as the um, team moniker goes, I've uh, been playing Feck for two or three years, and uh, man, fa best faction in the game for sure, without a doubt. So, it's such a good book. It's such a good army. I love the law. Like you read the law, and it just sucks you in. It just sucks you yeah. in. And um, yeah, uh, there's there's something deeply enjoyable to me about the knowing that you know the Carrion King himself is under his own delusion. And that to me is the, the best part of the faction. There's no such thing as like, it's not a guy pulling strings up top and everyone else is just in this illusion. Like, no, he's he's just as in it as everybody else. Everyone in there thinks they're the good guy um, as they march across the the realms doing, doing good guy stuff. And the best thing is like, I think a lot of us are just waiting for the day for Flesh Eater Courts to rise up against Nagash because for anyone who's watching this, who is not a Flesh Eater Courts player and you're not a law person, um, Flesh Eater Courts, as Josh is saying, doesn't fall under the legions. They're not a subservient. I mean, they're kind of like subservient because they have to, but for Flesh Eater Courts, they like, they, they don't see themselves as a part of Nagash's empire. And that's actually why Nagash put the original Carrion King locked away and uh, Sigma opened up the vaults thinking it was like some poor person that needed saving. And then the Carrion King went off free and uh, spread the grand delusion that is uh, the, the flesh eater courts. Well, I mean, he was a, 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 a he was a poor person. I mean, they he never deserved to be in there. It's just a great guy doing the best he could. So I think it's just always important to remember, you know, we are the underdog, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Nagash is, and look, Nagash is going to get his comeuppance one day, For but sure. let's talk this book. Okay. So Flesh Eater Courts prior to this book haven't been doing that well. Um, sure. You can do some decent tournament performances, but it's not that they were in the top 50% of the performance, you know, metrics, you know, and as we look at it, it's that new book syndrome. Blades of Corn, um, Glues by Gits, Heat Knights of Slanesh, like all Rough. of the K KO, they're all like really rising up. So our poor serfs haven't been doing so well. <laughs> but then all of a sudden we get this book and uh, you get a bunch of War Scrolls. What was your first impressions of when you picked up the book? And we will get into the weeds and I'll bring up the War Scrolls and we can um, unpack it a little further. But just high level, what do you think? So my my very first impression um, on seeing the war scrolls was I appreciated the glow up, you know, the the uh, at least my initial perceived glow up for one, the new royal, um, the royal serfs, and then as well as just the baseline increases to my favorite unit, um, the whores, um, cryptors. So those two things I immediately was like, yay, plus. And then I got immediately super concerned when I when I found out that it was a magic heavy uh, focus because that's kind of a struggling point for us. And then um, I got super happy again when I found out that uh, they had changed the rules to look out, sir. So hopefully my my guys would stay on the table at least for a couple turns um, for for more shooting matchups. So 
It was my first, so you, my first, and of course, glorious onward forward was my 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 main thought. You know, let's unpack that. You've gone through the wild emo, wild, wild uh, roller mm-hmm. coaster of emotion. So let's let's step back. War Scrolls got changed. You thought, cool. Um, the whole book didn't get for anyone who hasn't picked up the book and maybe hasn't seen it just yet. The book doesn't revisit the entire flesh eater court so your grand your um sub faction rules haven't changed you haven't got any new artifacts you don't have grand strategies and battle tactics added to the faction so it's not like a holistic rewrite of flesh eater courts that's just set the context josh when you saw that do you think all of a sudden flesh eater courts became overpowered as a faction it was just like a nice quality of life upgrade like where, where does it rank I, I think that you you'll see a market improvement in its win rate in the tournament setting. I think that you'll see a, probably a couple point bump. Um, I think that a lot of unfortunately what determines what's good and what's bad are more the battle tactics um, and the battle plans themselves. And I think that you know and that's just true for all factions across the board, right? In a competitive sense. But I think that um, having a baseline increase on a couple of war scrolls gives you more play into different lists. Um, I think. There was really only one list that was performing really well statistically, and that was the two, you know, big nine blocks of horrors or some variation on that. Um, I think like Blish Skin was solid, like 43% win rate, 40% win rate, you know. Um, so I think that that's my initial impression is that like yes, um, we have a little bit more variance in our list building. We have a little bit um, a wider, broader pool of maybe different unit choices. Um, which is good in a faction that just doesn't have a wide range to begin with. So, yeah, yeah, I, I'm really hoping that Flesh Eater Courts, the reason that you are the last to be updated, even af- after Cities of Sigma, is that you are getting a range expansion. That's all I can hope for because you're right. I actually I, I play FEC. Um, I bought four start collecting boxes when I was in England because it was like basically buy one, get one free versus Australian prices. Pretty much. And yep. That's basically the faction, other than army. like a va- other than a Vargulf, and obviously now our Underworlds warbands. It's basically mm-hmm. it. Yeah, I mean, it was it was probably, and this is I think one of the reasons it, it has suffered um, at times in its win percentages because hey man, this is one of the cheapest factions in the game to get into. This is one of the easiest factions to get into, and that's actually one of the reasons I started playing the faction because I was brand new to wargaming and I walked in a GW store and I was like, hey man, I don't want to spend a lot of money and I want to do this wargaming thing, so you know, show me the two or three cheapest armies. And that was one of them um, because you could buy four, four star collectings and you were done pretty much, you know, you'd mock up a little fake arc regent and, you know, you were good to hook. You'd, you'd go straight in and play, play 2k games. And it was, it was too easy by comparison to some of these, you know, gloom spites or something where you've got 150 models you're trying to prep for the board, you know? Yeah. Particularly when way- you were running uh, the dragon list. So yeah yeah well funnily enough that's why i got into flesh eater court so original book original first edition book there was a battalion called the royal menagerie which is essentially what became grizzle gore and that's what i got into it but you could you, you couldn't get terror guys as battle line back then so i still had to run three units of ghouls plus <laughs> a general and then three terror guys slash zombie dragons and they used to heal d6 um plus one i think it was every turn which was that's really cool. cool back then bring that Thanks. back i'd appreciate it <laughs> so would i so would i i've got five terror guys but okay so quality of life there's been a bunch of war scroll improvements not everything just mm-hmm. select three war scrolls ghouls horrors mm-hmm. flayers that those those and those only yep. you had you've you've got the new general's handbook so i'd love your just your thoughts around at the moment we are in a magic army a uh, meta and flesh eater courts play a little magic it's a bit like self deep self buffing and debuffing but you're not very good you're not very strong generally at magic no and it's a it's i would say it's a real bummer and this is kind of like your worst matchups in a competitive sense are almost always going to be um someone who either can blow through your units completely um or someone who uh shuts down your magic completely so i think that flesh eater courts tends to be an incredibly important deployment army understanding deployment is incredibly important in fact more than some other armies just because your your ranges are incredibly important um, a lot of your buffs are 24 inches um so so maintaining that standoff distance where your wizards are going to be where your units are that are fighting are going to be 
um, keeping them ored properly, and then the enemies, wizards, to go ahead and kind of counteract that, or counteract your attempts to buff. Um, is super important to understand. But for the new book, uh, my initial thoughts are, one, I value taking a spell lore a lot more than I used to. Um, and some of the lists that we'll look at today don't, I didn't go super in the, you know, in the weeds to make sure that every spell is exactly what this list needs, because a lot of them don't. They're, they're kind of like your personal choice. Um, and I feel like more than ever before, taking a spell lore so that you can tech into one of the new three spells, um, I think is, is going to pay dividends. Do you think something like the Dermal Robe uh, getting plus one to casting, dispelling, and unbinding is either something you're now choosing or is even more important? Because plus one to cast, plus one to spell, plus one to unbind, plus primal dice, plus arcane, um, yeah. That's for, for a non-magic army, that's a really good start. It is. Um, I do think it's important. The, the question right now in my list building tends to be, do I want to take... A lot of times it tends up to be, do I want to take the dermal robe or do I want to spell lore um, for the whole for the whole army? And I find that if I I think if I have three to four wizards, which most of my lists have at least three wizards, um, I usually in this book probably would rather take the spell lore for flexibility. And it's only because as some of my wizards spread out, um, the ability for them to just have the blizzard spell. Um, yeah. as well as their other spell that they, they, you know, their buff spell that was super important so that they can probably juice themselves up with every primal dice I have, probably blow themselves up, but get that battle tactic to blow up an enemy unit, right? To seal that at like turn four or five um, is the difference between getting four battle tactics and maybe five in a game. Yeah, I'm hearing stories from uh, the Games Workshop Tarcoma tournament that's happening kind of right now. Mm -hmm. And the Blizzard spell, Merciless Blizzard, being so effective, not only to kill units, but to get through things like the Ethereal Vampire Lord on Zombie Dragon. Because like when you look at your faction, you're like, how do I put down this Ethereal Zombie Dragon that can heal up six wounds, or six wounds after mm -hmm. it fights? Like it's a nightmare to get through. Um, this merciless blizzard, while it's a casting value twelve, um, I can see being very powerful and something you want to have up your sleeve. Let alone hoarfrost, which um, is going to be very helpful, especially is, on something like your ghouls and that. For sure, yeah. I think um, that you. So that's kind of what I was trying to get at: is the flexibility of knowing that your 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 arch regent, particularly if you're going to go second to locust, you know. Now she's multicasting, and she can go ahead and do the buff. She can also do um, ferocious hunger, so now she gets the double buff option, you know. And then you have the flexibility to throw on, you know, the mystic shield or um, something else onto that unit, and then send them off to go to die. Um, I think it it kind of just increases your again your flexibility um, more in this this magic game. What about the third the third change that's happened, and that would be the uh, the changes to lookout, sir. So look at Sir is as always been minus one to hit, um, but you've also got the old rules. Well, sorry, the old general's handbook rules, where if a sub commander, basically a, a non-unique hero, is within one inch of a troop battle line troop, uh, you uh, you can't be picked as a target. So that rule from the last season is now kind of ported over to the new season, which is uh, which is amazing. For us, it's a, it's fantastic. Um, we suffer from the fact that most of our support heroes, like most people's uh, in the game, are kind of squishy and they're not meant to be frontline troops. Um, it's definitely a glow up uh, that that's a built-in, baked-in thing. Um, huge, huge gains, and I would say that that probably Feck would be tanking in its win percentage if they had not done that. I think probably several other armies would have been too. Um, you kind of you kind of can't have wizards be the focal point in their small hit point pools and, and bad defense and then expect them to execute against shooting armies otherwise. So, Yeah. And the, the small heroes, I'm sure people watching this are already across it, but for anyone who might be picking this up for the first time, um, you, I, I don't want to say that flesh eater courts is reliant on heroes cause you're not, but the muster ability and some of the other things that come from your, um, like your courtiers and things, you've got to protect them. You've really got to protect them because that's where a part of your power and, and the frustration of, of, of starting to kill some of your models. And then a horror comes back, a flayer comes back, ghouls come back. It's just like this never ending, uh, annoying sandwich that you're giving me. Um, 
you've got to take out the heroes. So being able to protect them a little more um, because they aren't durable. They're not lots of wounds. They're not really tight um, ward saves. They're not really good armor saves. They they can die quickly. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I'll, I'll say just as a concern there, um, as a concern for people is um, when you're looking at that 12 inch rule, make sure that you're, you're, you're positioning your front unit that protects your hero so that you're bubbling out someone from being able to deep strike effectively, but you're keeping your hero within range of the lookout sir rule. So it's kind of a, a, a double requirement there from a, a tactical perspective that, hey, I want to make sure that if they come within here, I either get redeploy shenanigans to protect my guy or um, I get the ability to go ahead and cover him with lookout sir and extend the unit far enough so that people can't deep strike in and then shoot him. Um, it's a hard it's a hard thing to do, um, but just... And it, and there's going to be more shenanigans like deep striking, especially some of the uh, some of the uh, the the battle plans um, do allow you to move around a little bit more. So, um, For sure. all right, is there anything you want to talk a bit more about? Just flesh eater courts in general, or do you want to get? Let's bring up the war scrolls and and talk a little bit about like what you've got and maybe contextualize how maybe in this general's handbook of Antor and and the current meta. What do we like? What don't we like? Thoughts on the changes? I, I would. I, I think I'm probably going to have this kind of like as a recurring theme. The battle tactic um, for two fallbacks and two charges in the same turn. Um, us having to lean back maybe on some of our pretty bad, but maybe situational uh, faction battle tactics. Um, they They all point towards more flexibility than in last leagues last seasons to me. So I'm building my lists with more MSU, you know, more minimum small units. Um, I'm t I tend to build my lists um, to be more flexible just because of the fact the battle tactics kind of necessitate it. And I feel like the battle plans also feed into greater tactical flexibility so that you can make sure you're hitting five of five on your games, um, which again, when you're playing with your buddies, doesn't really that matter that much. But if you're a, you know, a, a, an amateur professional, um, then, then you, then you're trying to hit them. So, but yeah, that, yeah that's you, basically what I would say. No, absolutely. And that's partially why I also said at the start that don't think this is going to rocket flesh eater courts to five and oh, it's not, it's no. not that you've got this whole big change and you got, you know, new overpowered grand strategies and you're not zinch. You don't, you actually have to work for half your stuff. Right. So, um, <laughs> you have to work for yeah. your wins. A adding one AP to to a couple war scrolls does does not an army make so <laughs> but it is going to help you be more competitive and that's kind of that's the tweak that i yeah. think we were looking for and will be enough until you get a flesh eater courts battle tome and games workshop if you're listening to me and i'm sure you are give me some independent courtier models i'm sick of buying a horus kit to try to fake up a haunter or a bloody inf give me some you make it's a rough. war band Make me an Underworlds Warband that is like one courtier, like one version of all the courtiers. I can buy them; they're all my heroes. Done. Yeah, and, and yeah, <laughs> there's something something like that. Even just like a a fun undead themed box, right? That was almost not even necessarily just flesh eater courts, a hundred percent, but just was a fun themed thing that you clearly could go ahead and scratch build or kit bash very easily into all of these different things would be great. So that I'm not buying an extra fifty dollar box. For, for one model and then you, one model and, and then you got two others that you can't use you got like, two others that you can't use exactly because they come in sets of three yeah it's it's one of the most uh deeply unsatisfying things about running your flare or your horror army yeah yeah for sure yeah I, I i i appreciate that so we have a new <laughs> we actually have a new war scroll so let's let's before we get into the the upgrades we have a new marrow scroll war war her I'm, I'm making up words that i'm reading you're good a marrow yeah. scroll herald now this is um uh it's a, a minor hero so move six you know you i'm sure you've read the war scroll by now mm -hmm. It's combat profile's okay. If you're going to take it, re if you're taking this realistically, the King's Entry is probably the standout rule. I'm going to sure. shut up. I want Josh to tell me, when you looked at this War Scroll, what are your thoughts? Do you like it? Is this plugging a gap that Flesh Eater Courts had? Is there a particular build that 
this particular this model is going to slot into better than others like where are you at um so this model to me is all over the place uh and the unit rules are kind of all over the place i love conceptually this hero and i think it fills like a design space that flesh eater courts doesn't have which is like unique weird thing right all of our stuff is like very along the same line of like hey this is a buff piece it does this aura it does this thing and they they kind of all feel to be like one note in terms of how most of our heroes work uh, particularly the foot heroes i want to say one i love the model itself i think the model's glorious i want to get one to paint um I think that they they the the only issue I have with it from a competitive standpoint is just that I think at 115 points it's too much. I think that if it was costed lower towards like a courtier, a smaller courtier, something like a gas courtier, um, I think that this would see a whole bunch of play. I think the super interesting thing about it is that don't shoot the messenger thing. Um, so you might have the ability to kind of tech play it and block out shooting armies and stuff. Um, so definitely maybe look into picking one of these up for your local meta if you play with a lot of shooting friends um just because you can kind of like move block with it and do some other stuff um, with it that you can't do with other stuff just because of its cool little um six inch uh kind of uh bubble i guess i don't know um but as far as the king's entreaty goes it's super flavorful it's super fun but i don't know how effective the bravery shenanigans are and i don't think teching into uh like the old style of playing um the bravery shenanigans with taking the you know the potentially two different artifacts at minus one or minus two bravery i don't think it's it fits in that build either which was you know a very like flare heavy blister skin list um so huge 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 love on this this war scroll for its thematic funness um i don't i have never i have not yet found a build where it actually seemed to shine um yet i guess that's that's unfortunately where i think i think i'm at for for this particular war scroll you are very very kind uh i'm sure other guests would have <laughs> said this is dark Look, I, I'm not here to say it's garbage, and if you like it, you do you. Yeah. I'm not here. Uh, fr from a yeah. competitive point of view, when I look at this, it doesn't feel like it's plugging a gap. So when I look at the war scroll, don't sh don't shoot the messenger. Okay, it's nice, but not necessarily something that I've really needed, especially no. now that we've got the upgraded lookout, sir. In addition to that, you look at the King's Ent Entreaty, right? And, like, it kind of is the – it's, it's the slanish version of the Temptation dice. Yep. Except it's, it, instead of taking mortal wounds, you get strike first. Now, yeah, I don't care. I, for, 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 for mo I, I'm talking on behalf of the opponent. Mm -hmm. I'm more likely just going to refuse your, your infected bone and, okay, you strike first. Great. I, I, the, think, I think I'm okay. Only, I think I'm okay. Yeah. The the only time the strike first really matters is it gives you the opportunity to strike and then select another unit to go ahead and do the feed feeding frenzy and pile and fight twice. So that's that's the only scenario. But the problem is, if if you have the super juiced up unit that's next, you know, is going to get the strike first. That was the one I was going to strike first with anyway. If I was the one that, charged, that was going to be my point. It's not that strike right. first. I don't value. I don't value. It's not that I don't value strike first. Strike first is awesome, but strike yeah. first in this situation, I'm like, okay. It's it, it's it's very situationally useful, and like in one in twenty games, you'd be like, that was amazing. That felt so good. But did it on the average game? Is usually it doesn't play into how Feck plays, right? Which is juice up a death ball, throw it into the enemy, trade up delete a bunch of stuff that you know way more than that unit was worth um and you you're that little guy probably isn't going to be there most of the time um and if he is there someone's just going to take the damage because it's way less than you know having a a weird scenario of maybe having multiple juiced up units fight you at the same you know in in that particular instance so the other part to this josh fun. that that we both acknowledge is that there's probably over, oh, look, I haven't done the maths. I'm picking this number out of the sky, but let's say 50% mm -hmm. of the armies right now have bravery 10 or at least bravery yeah. eight or nine, like a really high bravery. So the yeah. likelihood of you infecting somebody and then looking for the two, the two D six and beating my bravery to issue receive. And now look, if it happens, 
and it's a situation Great. where cool. I really needed to issue it. Absolutely, you're going to get it. But it's so many situations, like if then, if yeah. then, if then, it's like yep. it's not enough for me as a competitive war scroll. If it didn't have that portion about bravery really being involved in the mechanic, then it's far more interesting, right? Where it's, if it was just like, hey, man. Um, on a five up, you know, on a five up the, four up. Boom, right? You, you take a bunch of damage and you can't do it. You know, you can't use a command trait or can't command ability. Then, then we're talking. Because now I can basically suicide this guy in to turn off a block that's super important, right? Uh, you know, yeah. Cool. But he's fun, it's a great. Though. He's a cool it's looking a, model. It's a cool model. It has fun rules. Uh, absolutely yep. go pick it up if this is your jam. But would I take this to a tournament and expect to do well? There's no, no. list tech that's standing out to me right now that I need this at, over another version of a courtier, another block yes. of ghouls, an uh, endless spell. Yep, particularly because, you know, at 115, that perfectly does hit the metric for another block of horrors and another block or another haunter courtier, right? So, so you are literally giving up what is a very useful piece for a situationally fun piece. Again, bring it with your friends, have a great time. You know, I, I the, there's, a, there's a guy named Shannon um, out in Colorado who's like a very, very thematic effect player. He's beautiful army, beautiful stuff. He always brings his stuff in like a big chest box. It's very, very uh, properly done. I can see him running this just so he can do the scroll, like he hands the scroll to the opponent or whatever at the game table. If you're that guy, you're taking this guy whether or not he's good and you're gonna, your opponent's going to love it. So. All right. I think we've, I think we nailed this point across, but Hey, Probably, if you're listening yeah. to this, if you're listening to this folks and you think that Josh and I have both missed something and there's a, a combination that we have completely missed, I want you to let me know because ge genuinely I want to know how to make the most of this model. And there's a couple of them from this box, like the, um, the gets one as an, another example, as a gets play, I'm like, I don't need this. This is not something for me. This is clearly for somebody yeah. else. Mm-hmm. Not for me. Um, but what is for me is our mm -hmm. ghouls. Now, ghouls had a war scroll changed. So, Josh, what has happened to our little old ghouls? So, instead of... So, two two big things. One, instead of reroll ones, we've picked up a pip of AP. So, we've, sorry, pip of rent. Sorry, my 40k was showing. Um, so, that inherently is always huge in a war scroll, right? Getting just one piece of rend is, is a big deal when it comes to potential damage outputs um, as averages, particularly when we're just looking at like a, a, you know, a naked unit that's not being buffed by something. It just it marginally becomes way more usable. And then the other thing too is boundless ferocity has been changed where instead of having um, plus one attack, which would have been 10 in a Morgant list um, or 20 just in any list, you know, if you had more than 20 models, right, you get a plus one to attack to the whole army or to the whole unit, which was cool. Um, now they auto wound on sixes or fives, again, depending on when that rule takes effect. Um, so I think that the, the coolest use of this is going to be just in economies, particularly with the new um, is it Horfrost, whatever the new, the new spell is, um, so that you can go ahead and effectively make a big blob of ghouls a hits on twos, auto wounds on fives, um, and then and then now has a pip of rend inherently. I think you should, you should start seeing efficiencies where once you've thrown on plus three attacks onto that unit, you will see it absolutely blender things that it never could have in the past. And I think it makes Morgaunt a lot more lethal just because its base war scroll is, I think, a, a good chunk better. Yeah. If you apply Hoarfrost, would you put it as rend or would you put it as to hit? I think it would entirely depend on whether on how many attacks I got, uh, and that's not based on the math I've done. It's based on my gut, um, just for how I tend to roll, um, and it would definitely depend on what I was attacking, right? So if it's a, if it's a thing that's a four up, uh, I'm okay with taking it to a five up probably. If it's a thing that's a two up, then I'm going all rand all day. Okay. Um, the, the the reason I ask is the payoff going mm -hmm. from a because uh, obviously like all I can all add attack here, right? So a four to a three. Sure. The difference that the the numeric difference between a three and a two it sure. is not a lot. So, I, I mean, going but, but from you're a, not a, fighting twice. True. Right. So then that's always where the numbers come in. And like I said, I would have to run the numbers, and we'll get to that. I found that this is one of the most number crunchy 
armies because there are a lot of um, different variables of who fights twice, where did the buff go, um, and then what are you attacking? Um, you'll notice like different metrics of efficiency in the army that get wildly fluctuating depending on what those three variables are. So, And I guess in um, saying all that, if you're going to put Hoarfrost on a unit, you want that unit fighting twice. So if you got the flayers time. and the ghouls, whatever's getting Hoarfrost is the thing that you want yeah. fighting twice. So I was thinking as like two different options and mm-hmm. that might make sense. Um, but I guess it stops you as well yeah. from being broad. Like you, you, you don't care about being broad, right? You, you straight in, correct? Two up, you, you commit, and yep. you're not concerned about the CP. And and again, it's just dependent on what you're going into, right? If you're going up to a two up save, then it's obvious the three run is the way to go every time, right? But if you're if you're going into you know um, a four up save or something like that, then probably the efficiency is on the two up, uh, just to make sure that most of your attacks are going through. And like I always say let the enemy make the bad rolls right the more the more you make someone roll the more chances they have to to roll spike really bad yeah by the way when i say uh, i don't worry about being roared clearly roared will impact feeding frenzy i'm talking i'm i'm I'm, what i'm talking about here is the the um all that attack not necessarily feeding frenzy the roar will screw your day regardless of what you're trying to cp and, and that's one of the we'll get to it, but that's one of the coolest things about the new the new boys, um, the the royal serfs, um, the royal ghouls. The fact that when they're within three, uh, or when they're within engagement range of a monster, they don't get a monster's action is wildly cool, particularly when you have hoarfrosted them, and then particularly some of the tech um, with their alternate new profiles. So, so follow up questions here: Would mm-hmm. you run? Are you running new ghouls? I 100% will run new ghouls as my summon. So your arch regent, it doesn't care whether or not you summon new ghouls or old ghouls. It just says summon a unit of 20 serfs. So, I mean, obviously current ghouls are 80 for 80 points for 10. I think it's 120 or 115, something like that for the, the new ghouls. It's like, hey man, why would you not run the new ghouls? Um, just, from, just from a points perspective, even if they weren't that much better, um, you're... You're basically, you know, you're getting more for your money in that sense. Um, but in, in, I originally was super down on the new ghouls. I'm gonna be honest. I looked at them. I was like, eh, who cares? Um, but, but a little tech things like that anti roar, um, the new tech thing of you can pull some of those ghouls out um, because the courtier's ruling says, hey, on a two up, you add a model back to the surf's unit. So those dogs are multi wound. The leader is multi-wound. Um, there's lots of decisions to be made for how you pull those guys and put them back in that unit. Um, anyway, I know different ghoul, different war scroll. So, so maybe I'm, I'm getting off off topic here. But I would just say those two things collectively, the, these two new war scrolls, this war scroll, and then the new ghoul, other ghoul, the royal ghoul, um, is, I think, going to breathe life into some old Morgant lists that have not seen good play in a long time. And that was the question behind my question was, uh, would I run yeah. ghouls in the current? Because uh, it's been a long time since we've seen armies based around ghouls. Um, yeah. Now, yeah, you can flood the board if you really want to, um, but it's mostly been about flayers and horrors and grizzle yep. gore, um, really, for the last couple of years. Yeah, for sure. And I do think that there is now... And again, it depends on how the meta shifts, right? It, it's all going to depend on how the meta shifts. It's it's all going to be, hey, what are you seeing in, in your own individual meta, like the place where you live, who's playing what? I think, though, that more than ever, there are gr- there are extremely good Morgant uh, board, like mid-board playlists. And what I mean, when I say mid-board for anyone who's not more competitive, I'm saying I literally just kind of toe into the middle of the board. I castle up a bit on my, my deployment zone, and I control um, the middle portions of the board. And the second you come in to contest that is when I will counterpunch really aggressively into you. Um, but I'll let you kind of come to me and make make mistakes, and then I will threat saturate on set threat saturate into you, um, trying to keep my wizards out of your deny range, out of your um, dispelling range. Yeah, even if you took two units, uh, look, you could absolutely build some good lists, especially in Morgant, w- that's focused around reinforced ghouls. 
But then again, even if you weren't taking reinforced ghouls, I could see two units of of ten. Um, they could be the great uh, ones that activate the the retreat, and then someone else charges as that wave exactly. battle tactic. Um, protect your your sides, and you know stop some of the ambushing and a place green. So um, yeah, I like um, I, I, I like it. Yeah. Yeah, me, me too. I, I just generally feel like, hey, when you get that extra, that I would say this though, again, super important to protect your heroes, right? Because again, the second that you lose an 18 inch away abhorrent, or you lose your nine inch away core tier, whatever you're relying on to get that AP bonus, when that unit's gone, not only did you lose your other support functions it does, but now you've also lost the pip of AP that maybe makes that unit return to being even worse than it used to be. Um, so again, in some ways, even more technical play required uh, to not lose your guys. And we'll see if if the met, you know, Lookout Sir saves us a lot for shooting, but it does not save us for the hero phase. And that's my biggest worry is, is yeah. that. So. Yep. Yeah, which is funnily enough why one of my lists at the moment as a goblin player, I'm picking a fungoid cave shaman that can't be p targeted if you're outside of twelve. I'm like, yeah, suck on that one. That's you awesome. can't get my general. You can't find my general because he's only a five wound cool. idiot. So I'm like, mm -hmm. he, he, he's going to die. Uh, but what isn't going to die is our crypt horrors. So crypt horrors have had a little bit of a change. I'm on team flayer to be honest. I've always been a flayer over a horror mm -hmm. kind of guy. But what's changed, Josh? So uh, we see a couple things. One, we see instead of the reroll all hits, which was my favorite thing in the whole game, just because of the fact it was hilarious in today's version of AOS 3 to be uh, bringing in a reroll all hits um, unit. It just made your opponents be like, what? Like, when are we, is this 2018? Like, what is happening? Um, it was pretty funny to bring in, particularly when you're bringing, like I, I um, saw a lot of success in bringing two blocks of nine. Um, and when they, the points dropped as much as they did, um, and then you had these hilarious, you know, plus seven attack, you know, seven attacks, a hundred something hits, all rerolls, fight twice, all reroll wounds because the zombie dragon was there too. It was, uh, you, you took 30 minutes to do an attack and you just deleted anything in the game. So it was funny. That's not there anymore, um, which I think everyone who is not me is probably super excited about. Uh, but what we did, what we did get is again a pip of rend, which makes this as a baseline general purpose unit a lot better. Um, and you also heal d3 instead of one, which are both yes. generally speaking glow ups. Um, there's a slight difference in wording just for us competitive nerds. It says the damage characteristic is three instead of two now, which is different than improve the damage by one. Um, there's some rules interactions there that are slightly different. Um, I could be wrong about that. It's that's what I remember. At least it said improve the damage by one. But either way, no, no, no. Um, I'm 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 looking at our shout out to our friends Wapedia, and it looks like yeah. it's the unmodified wound roll. It has damage of no, no. It's the same. Uh, three yeah. instead of two. Okay, cool. Um, so so no change there. Um, but just generally speaking, hey, the biggest change besides the AP, that's cool and everything. That's great. Makes them a much more uh, reliable unit. But let's be let's the real talk right is with. Galician uh, veterans gone. Now we have a two inch range. I so was going to ask that... you about this. Although, although the other yep. change, I think, uh, unless it's a spelling mistake for me, is you've gained an extra attack. You used to only have three attacks, and now you've got four. Mm -hmm. So you've gained an extra attack. You've gained the rend, uh, and you're healing a little bit more. I, and I would so so I would just say generally, they're probably my pick again as a horror guy who has twenty four horrors sitting at home. They are my, um, I'm super stoked because my list just got stronger flat out with, you know, with, with no negatives, no points, losses or nothing. So that's just an interesting point. Like we, you, we saw almost no points changes in flesh eater courts for any of the things that were the strongest things. So all of these are just flat buffs. There is no, mm. there was no real loss at all. Um, and this, I would say is probably the, the unit that, that benefited the most for sure. Cause those blocks used to not be able to push through. I mean, I killed Nagash. Sorry, I didn't kill the guy. I killed Archaon with the Nurgle minus one to wound with putting 18 horrors around him and just beating him to death over three turns. Um, actually, for, for a 5-0 win, which was funny. But generally speaking, they're not supposed to get through two-up saves, and now they, they honestly can. Um, it's pretty cool. Talk to me about the Galatian champion thing, because when you started talking about double reinforcing this unit, so they come in threes. Uh, oh, by the way, there, there's another change for us. A good change is the, co uh, the co 
Oh, the yes, co- the, the coherency change. Yeah. I was going to say cohesion. I'm like, no, that's not the word I wanted to say. Coherency. <laughs> coherency sure. now changing. So instead of it being uh, one to five, uh, it's now one to one six, six, which is going to yeah. play so well to your horrors and your flayers. It does. Yeah, for sure. Um, and f- so for me, um, my main tournament list, um, which we're not going to go over today, but my main tournament list runs one block of nine now and two blocks of six, specifically just because I can screen a lot more effectively for my castle. And I think you have a lot of really cool orientations now where you can make huge, big boy, chunky Roomba lines, right, of, of six, um, particularly as columns to fit them into uh, kind of like a spearhead and then having them both pile in, um, I think has a lot of interesting play just for for how you move and how you keep your core tiers kind of like in between two columns. I think it's also thematic and fun and it looks cool when you charge them uh, as columns instead of as, you know, big front blocky lines like we used to do. So pretty, pretty stoked by the change. Again, just solid glow ups across the, the war scroll. Isn't a unit of nine playing in redundancy though? Like you surely don't get all nine in for combat. Yeah, you gain the extra range, but you're on pretty big bases. Like fifties. It's it's, it's uh, they're they're forties. I know 40s. think I could be wrong. Maybe they're fifties. Maybe you're right. They're fifties. I, I had to buy a, a giant bag of weird millimeter, you know, bases. Um, but the the point of the nine for me in in the last season and the reason it was so successful is because again I'm, I'm it's a midboard list so i'm saying hey you have to come to me i'm going to slowly win on points unless you can test some of these things um and you can never push over i don't care what army you're in you can never push over a block of nine without committing a main asset yeah. and since since i will particularly with our ability to double muster on one of our foot heroes particularly with the ability of make sure that you're you know you have um your back person in the unit so you know your your farthest back guy in the unit is within touching within um two or three of your core tiers so if you need to you can effectively roll 18 24 dice to hit the eight five ups you need to entirely return that unit you start making it so that they must commit a hundred percent to delete the unit or they know that they will lose because you will on your turn refill and clap back um that's the only reason yeah. to take nine. No, you, you see this build a lot in the trogs uh, as well, like this big anvil. Yep. And it's not that you think you're going to get all nine into combat. I mean, you're playing for redundancy, so a couple will die. But when you do get into combat, you are still at peak with your six or your seven. And to your point, rally, muster, ways to bring yep. back models will then bring back the efficiency. The, the nine block is there only for getting double turned. That is the reason it's there. It's to try and keep the unit alive through a double turn. Um, you're sacrificing flexibility. You're sacrificing more six-man units that are, again, um, kind of the way that I'm more leaning in, in this particular set of battle plans and this particular set of, of battle tactics. But at least, again, for the last season, I, that, was a, that was a problem that I made the enemy solve every time. Is How are you going to get rid of these? You have to get rid of them at some point. So that means you have to go all in. And since my my list usually runs the two dragons, it meant, cool, you're all in, and now I don't have to even throw a dragon away. I could just put a terror geist right there and and go to town on my turn. And it's big enough that you can't ignore it. A six, Correct. six you can work around, you can chip at. Nine, yeah. you've, got, you've got to go in. So uh, I guess this is a theory, folks, if you're listening to this, and like, are you thinking about double reinforcing? Are you keeping yeah. them? Because um, Josh was talking earlier about, minimum size units. Do I just run lots of threes and flood the board with lots of threes? Yeah, th- those are the two decisions to make. I'm leaning more, and we'll see it in the list at the end. I'm leaning more now towards running several six-mans just because the coherency differences and, and the battle tactics tend to, to make me want to do that more. Um, but I, I don't know if I can get away from Feast Day and for my own tournament list. I don't know if I can get away from Feast Day and one nine block again. Because when you put the five-up ward and the, the Mystic Shield on it, it's, it's chonky. One 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 nine is is probably enough. Yeah. Um, the last one, the last war scroll change that we got, and uh, feel free if you want me to pull up some of the the maths hammering. So Josh did some maths hammering in preparation for this, but my favorite, so I've got twelve of these at home, is the crypt flayers. Um, so a couple of changes, and the most important one probably comes from the death scream. Yeah, um, not. 
I'm going to be honest. I'm not as positive as you are on them. Um, I I think you'll still always need three. You're always going to need three because if you're running a terror guy, so those are the three that you're going to summon every time. Um, or at least I can't think of a time when you wouldn't. I'll put it that way. Um, but I, uh, so, you know, general changes, not too much their melee. Their melee got a little bit worse um, just because you can't go ahead and proc those mortals on sixes, which is unfortunate. Um, but I, as you discussed earlier, yes, we had a lot of armies that were like bravery nine, bravery 10. So the screams always kind of felt really hit or miss. Um, but I don't think that their range now is worthwhile enough to be worth their points. Mm. Um, I think the flayers have always suffered. And I say always, I mean, like in the last, whatever, couple of years, they, um, have suffered the same problem, which is that 540 points for the block of nine, which is kind of what you would love for just for at least efficiency in terms of, um, uh, you know, unleash hell and that kind of stuff. Um, it was always kind of questionable at more than a third of, you know, more than a quarter of your army going towards a third of your army for that one block. So then you were running a bunch of six mans and that didn't feel as good. I think in the last edition, it, it might feel a lot better now, to be honest, but I, I'm just a little torn. I don't think of us as a shooting army. And I think for me, I'm not a blister skin guy. Um, so I'm inherently not super up on them. I don't know what, I mean, you, you're up on them. Why, why are you up on them? Tell me why. So it's not that I'm up on them. Um, it's so you've had a, a fundamental change here. So uh, the old war scroll was was just for anyone who either hasn't seen it or needs a refresher. Um, oh, you would do it. You, no, 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 not at all, not at all. Um, so you do a bravery. Basically, basically every of your flayers would roll two d six. If you were in combat, you within three, you get to um, basically add two to the roll or subtract two to the person's bravery. The difference between the, the 2d6 and the bravery would be mortal wounds. So you've gained rend, but you've lost mortal wounds. So that's probably the first change we want to talk about. I, and when, when I, I think it's a, go ahead, gone. Go ahead. No, keep, keep going. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I, again, it's just their 180 points. That's the, that's always my, <laughs> So, yeah, so what, what I was going to say from a War Scroll point of view, you've probably got more consistency across the board. Now the value of being able to hit something, regardless if you have high bravery or low bravery, it has a consistent job. But now you lack mortal wounds outside like your Terrorgeist. Do you need a whole bunch of Ren minus two one damage screams? Um, and I don't know. And the problem is, you know, if you look at the amount of damage that really is, Right, which is what 12, 12 attacks for the unit have done a four. So now I got six going to wound. You know, that functionally means at the end of the day, the 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 enemy's making like three saves probably somewhere around there on a good roll. So it's three minus two at one. You know, it so is, if you it is four attacks, each of them are four attacks. That's twelve attacks across three models. Right. So, you know, so 12 attacks for a unit of three, right? And then half that for a four up to hit. So now I got six going into wound. I wound on a three. So now the enemy is making like four, probably three to four saves. Um, pretty, pretty reliably. I guess there is the bonus, right, for the plus one if they have a low bravery, but probably pretty rare again, like we're saying in this day and age to have, you know, six, six or less. Um, but then, so you're only probably putting in probably four saves for the enemy or so statistically on average. So it's four saves. So at most on a unit of three, you're doing, you know, three, four damage. Um, I I liked it more when they either did a hell of a lot or they did nothing because it was so, funny. So <laughs> this, this 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 is my my conclusion. I yeah. think the role I think the role has changed. I think what they're trying mm. to do instead of you totally commit, because what you saw with flayer lists is people would fully commit, as you mentioned, look for everything that could debuff under the sun. And when you went hard, you filled the board with all flayers. And I think yep. the way I read this is you will likely take a unit of three to six flayers in your flesh eater courts, regardless of your build, it will play a role like a, like a artillery or some type of shooting unit, but you don't go all in. And you don't need sure. to go all in. So this could be great to kind of go ahead of your horrors, uh, clear off some chaff, and then let your horrors get into the into the good stuff. 
but you probably don't build a list around flayers. That's that's yeah, kind of my my read. Agreed. Yeah, it just going pure blister skin flayers is probably not as good. And it was it was fun, but questionably good statistically speaking before. Um, yeah. I know the like. Uh, the last GT I went to in, in Colorado, there was like so many feck players. There was like six of us there. And I think like three or four of them were blister skin and they all kind of had the same list. And it was kind of like, yeah, man, it's cool. But there's too many matchups that just, just don't care. And that's, and that's overall, I think it's a better change, but you do yeah. lose the people who are building into it and going yeah. hard. You've lost no debate. Yeah. You, you didn't get any better, but if I'm running a Morgant, a Hollow Morn, if I'm running some other type of build, would I now go and build Crit Flayers into my list? I think so. I think possibly this is worth considering. I know that I personally won't, but what I will say is you always are going to get three because every time you're running a Ghoul King on Terrorgeist, you're going to summon three knights. And I'm still going to take Flayers over Horrors any day of the week. So, so you as a player still are always going to bring three of the match, right? Assuming you have a Ghoul King. You're always going to bring three no matter what. Um, 90, at least 99th percentile, right? Um, so, yeah. I, yeah. There's one rule that we haven't spoken about that is unique. Mm -hmm. that oh, I yeah, think the is new... fascinating. This is fascinating. So, yes. escort, escort courtiers. So, basically, if you have a small hero, so a, a hero that is uh, seven wounds or less, it can't fly. If it is wholly within three inches of a unit of uh, crypt flayers, it can basically hitch a ride, fly with the flayers, and then drop sure. uh, drop out, um, and just be outside of three inches of the the enemy. Like, and the meme <laughs> dream here is right. That, so this is why I'm so sad that they changed Arcane Tome. I I just wish that they had not changed it for the Smash Bat. If they said the Arcane Tome is no longer allowed to cast spells, you know, other spells. For every unit in the game, and then it had a little exception said, except the Vargulf, who who desperately needs the Arcane Tome to still exist, um, to be the old Smash Bat that he was for the Flaming Weapon upgrade, um, I'd be super happy. And if that still was a possibility, I would 100% run these, particularly because if you end up running the Ghoul King on Terror Guys, and this, uh, well, I guess it wouldn't work for the summoned uh, Vargulf, but it would let you basically kind of like yeet, slingshot in a Smash Bat. Um, since you could pick him up from the back of the unit and then throw him forward, um, it would be it would have been super cool. That being said, I still think there's some some Smash Bat play maybe, um, but in today's day and age, he just doesn't feel like he punches like he did four years ago. Talk to me about the rule. Ignore Flash Smash Bat. Like, sure. It, does this does this rule have a part? Especially as you said. You might summon on a unit of flayers. You got your backfield um, hero sure. who might have already used a channel throne to do its thing. Would you I, use this rule, and how how does it maybe get used on the table? So two things. One, I didn't I didn't see the seven wounds. So anyone who's a flesh eater courts like that's going mm, the Vargulf's eight wounds. Thank you. I caught you. You're correct. Um, but um, I I do think that there's a perfect situation where this comes out. But again, for me. I'm almost always summoning my three on the other en on the enemy's deployment zone, the other side of the board, right? So the only time that I'm going to be using this rule 99% of the time is if for some reason my my backboard kind of summoned units end up meeting up with my midboard, you know, control units, and then I have this opportunity to slingshot somebody onto a point to try and take it. Um, I think this would have been way more interesting last season where GCs being on points was super important. Yes. Um, I think this rule would have been amazing last thing, particularly when you had like Rhinox Hide and all these like cool things that, that played into a GC. I think it's this second, rule again. It's a second tunnel mask crazy. That it would have been. Yeah. It would have been super cool. Um, but I think us going out of that season and into a new season, I just, I look at this and I go, okay, there will be a game that I win the game because of being able to yeet a hero onto a point that I would never have been able to do uh, otherwise, but it'll be few and far between. And I don't see us having the foot heroes to really optimize this um, like as a normal plan, I guess, if that's the way I'll put it. It's funny though. No. It's fun. Look, it's a, it's a cool rule. And I, I thought about this a lot yeah. and I'm like, 
I don't think I would develop a game plan based around escort yeah. courtiers. But if I find myself in a position where I need to go shore up an objective or I need to get, yep. uh, I'm preparing for potentially a double turn and I want to get a wizard in range or in a different position to maybe go prepare sure. for a uh, merciless blizzard. This could be really helpful, but I don't think, well, actually maybe, maybe there, maybe there, maybe, it's maybe. if I'm going, if, if I'm going second yeah. and then I'm preparing for maybe a double turn and right. I'll get my wizard You're... within 12 and I'm going to go do yeah. merciless blizzard, maybe. Like, and that's, I guess the point I was trying to make is, is there's a, there's a moment, right. Where maybe you've ran forward some of your back pieces and you know, your, your deep summons, which for me is the only time I'm going to probably be playing uh, much flares. They've come up and they're in the mid board now too. And you have this golden opportunity on turn four and five to, you know, yeet the arch regent with flaming weapon because you took spell lore. And for some reason your arch regent has flaming weapon or whatever, you know what I mean? You're crazy tech. And now you have a super bomb, um, you know, ghoul king or something on foot. So you can, yeah. So when you do it in uh, the summon Imperial Guard, and you do your, that's all happening at the in the movement phase. So you could, yes, use escort courtiers, move up the board, then do the summon. Obviously, not near your channel throne, so you get it's going to cost you a CP. Um, stay outside of three inches. No, because the summoning occurs. Summoning occurs at the end of the movement phase. Yeah, so yeah, well, that's what I'm saying though. You use the escort courtiers oh. to move up the board, then you summon at the end of the movement phase. Right. What I'm saying yeah. though is you tra yeah, okay. you're trading off not using the charnel throne because you've moved away from it, um, but you are getting board position from the summon. Yeah. 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 Um, Again, I think we I, both agree it's, it's situational. <laughs> I think we, I think we both super like, situational. Yeah. yeah, and and to me, it'll always be prop for me at least. It'll always probably be a turn four, turn five play that I happen to find myself like it's a it's a new tech piece to know that I have that in the back of my my toolkit. Yeah. Yeah, it might be a great way to protect your wizard and like you got to keep it for your grand strategy or about, about whatever. I I think this is a rule that requires a lot of practice, like. Because we just this is a thing that we've never really had before. Um, and again, I wish it had been there last season because it would have been so much fun to play with this for big brain plays. Um, but I think um, I think it yeah, it's interesting. It's super interesting. Maybe maybe if I'm if I, if I get good, if I get good, I think I'll, we, uh, I'll get there. I think we both agree this is situational. Um, I will say though that I was a little disappointed. I thought you would get the Vargulf rule, not the Vargulf rule, the Varggeist rule, where instead of being set up, you can you can come in from reserve. I think that would have been more valuable uh, if you got that rule from from Soulblight. And cool. All right, which is which is always fun. Yeah. Very quickly before we get into your rules. If I was if I was a Soul Blight, uh, Ossiak Bone Reapers, or Nighthaunt, um, as a feck, feck player, do you value this combination of units and the rules that come with it? So the special rule for this region of Renown, Flesh Eater Courts, you can't take this. This is excluded from you, everyone who is not Flesh Eater Courts, uh, and you have the ability to run and charge. That's what you're essentially getting for 460. Yeah. So uh, what I will say... Is that you should 100% if you're a soul blight or a, you know Osirak player, you should 100% use this because this is your first chance you've ever had to play the good guys. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, jokes aside, though, in a competitive sense, no, this is not uh, good. And particularly because the second that you lose that herald, you lose a lot of your your inborn rules, um, and a lot of the rules don't synergize because a lot of the stuff is pretty reliant on the keyword courtier or the keyword abhorrent. Um, so a lot of like the buffs and the cool things we've talked about, like, oh, these guys got this. They no longer have them. Um, the second that that little Marrow Scroll Herald guy is going to die, and again, he's not uh, particularly uh, an important piece anyway. So no, short answer is no. This is not, this is a fun thing. This is super cool. Buy it so that you have the parts to go kit bash your other cool undead stuff. And that's, that's about it. Yeah, I struggled to find a reason why you would take it. And Josh and I both agree that, Part of the reason is like three horrors or three flayers don't do a lot. Um, so yeah. like, you know, if I'm going to take these as an ally, I'd much prefer to take six horrors uh, or six flayers 
as opposed to three and three. I don't need that in my like. I can't. I, I can't justify it in Nighthorn, in in, no. in Ossiarch, in Soul Blight. That's more zombies. That's more you know, Immortus Guard. That is more yeah, man. Uh, more of something that is put in this. That, put that super cool Mortis engine in there just for just for just for the glow up because that thing's awesome. So that that and that'll even in a list that doesn't make any sense that'll do more than this would. So yeah. Plus you'd yeah. have a cooler model. <laughs> Before we get into your War Scrolls to kind of like show this and how it all kind of comes together, mm -hmm. I know you did some homework on the average difference. So I'd love to like, you know, feel free to like talk a little bit more about some of this sure. and your observations. So this is, um, so these aren't perfect. So some of the new conditions and new rules are, so for anyone else who's running them and they're running them and they're smarter than me and they're not using a calculator, they're actually running them in Excel. Um, you'll notice that your numbers are probably slightly different, but these are pretty close. Um, so the first three colors, I'm colorblind, so bear with me, but the first three on the left, uh, the blue, the green, and the orange, those are basically your, your old ghouls, your new ghouls, and your royal ghouls at um, a 10-man unit with no buffs, just being in range of your respective courtier, um, or your abhorrent, sorry. Um, so the, the thing to take away is, yeah, on the right side of the house, um, you know, very low saves and that kind of stuff, they'll perform about the same with no buffs. Um, and that's fine, just because the more attacks on some of these units and that kind of stuff for ghouls um, will we'll be there. But if we, when we're looking towards the left, that's when it really matters, where you're starting to see both the, the new ghouls eke out, you know, a, a wound or two more on like a two-up save. Um, and this is, again, for this is for a minimum-sized unit with no buffs. So these, these, these look like only one or two wounds here, but those translate to like eight wounds when you add more attacks, you fight twice, you know, you do all these things, they, these start to become kind of exponential increases. Um, so, so particularly in the two up category, um, you see big changes. And then uh, this also kind of illustrates how much more damage these, the Royal guys can do um, percentage wise. Um, again, just because remember that these are like kind of exponential gains. When you start adding attacks and you start adding, um, fighting twice and then the, the two colors on the right um those are your new ghouls and old ghouls um you can horrors. see it's almost sorry horrors. sorry thank you horrors sorry um you're, you're looking at almost twice as much damage towards two up saves so this spike, significant this spike is huge it's a massive huge. spike absolutely huge yeah um and again with with two inch ranges with increased or uh, you know better coherency more more free flexible coherency and stuff again you're easier to get them in they're 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 just a general much better unit for for not having to put all the eggs in one basket and still being able to do some stuff i think for me i always compare you know if you're a 40k guy you always talk about like well how does it do against space marine you know what's it do against three ups i kind of think the same way um against stormcast which i know stormcast like aren't the boogie band so no one should be thinking that like stormcast the thing to beat right now but that is always my like um my benchmark is the three up save um and you know you, you just now you're looking at like hey one of these units can reliably and very easily do the five four to five wounds i wanted to do to maybe force someone to at least do enough damage to force their little chaff units to always have to take a bravery um you know I, they're just they're a little bit more effective and i think that'll translate out across the board over many things that's kind of one of the reasons again flexibility we have more than we used to have just because of the natural a uh, little bit increase on the, the war scroll yeah it, it's fascinating when you get into the weeds and you know we haven't looked at the other side which is you know safe stacking obviously a thing mystic mm -hmm. shield all that defense but like the old horrors versus the new horrors only when you go into no armor safe does yep. the old horrors war scroll stand out and to be yep. honest with you do you want to be putting your uh those horrors into a, a zero save like sure bunch of idiots probably not probably so, not I mean, it was it was was one of the funniest things in the world to watch a nine man block of horrors with full double re rolls go into like a zombie triple re you know double reinforced and pick up the whole unit in one attack was 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 fun, but that's a pretty pretty niche not not a standard day so though though at current tournaments killing units of zombies is something you need to consider otherwise those mortals are, are splashing back and, and uh, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you you will very easily be able to pick up sixty zombies. Like I, if I go first, I'll pick up sixty zombies every time, even with a six man block of horse. 
assuming I got some buffs off and I fight twice. Just yeah. just because you know you're looking at here, this is saying, oh hey, on average you're doing like ten. Well, that's with three three little horrors. So you're closer to twenty on average um, with a six man block, and then that's without any buffs and without fighting twice. And when you add on three more attacks, you're basically doubling the output of the unit. Now you're on average doing like 40 damage, fight twice puts you to 80, you know. You, it's it's extremely easy to clear chaff with horrors. Uh, oh, old ones or new ones, it's kind of irrelevant. They just, they, they, they mow things. Um, and you'll see that your ghouls actually mow a lot more than you thought to. Just again, way to dice, too many attacks. If you don't have a save, you're, you're in big, big trouble, so. For anyone who's wondering where this came from, uh, Stats Hammer, I think it is. Uh, there's a couple of like uh, math yeah. calculators out there. Stats Hammer is definitely a great one, but it's fascinating when you actually look at profiles and you start looking at like the full potential. And if you have a sub faction, you get extra rules, whether it's, you know, add plus one of this or extra attack here. Yeah. You can start to extrapolate and kind of see what the expectation of damage is so you can make better decisions on the table and, so and and why you're and while you're if you want to scroll down real quick at to the the new royal ghouls again you kind of you can kind of see how effective they are percentile was and it's prob the problem being or i guess the bonus being if you read the war scroll it says um one in every 10 must be a you know royal hunt guy and royal hunt guy has the uh flat three attacks um and then two of them are the dogs that have multi wound along with uh, the the hunt master. So you're actually getting way more wounds in this royal hunt um, set, and you're getting more high value, high damage units that you can either protect with a buffer of 14 ghouls, so that they get their attack in that turn, or if you're if you're the opposite side, they've already attacked, and you know that a courtier is going to return models, you can pull those big multi wound models first. Yeah. Um, and leave the ghouls to, to clog up that area. And then on your turn, boom, return the, the hunt's master right into the front. And on your turn, he gets to attack first again to do more damage, right? So um, some some tech play there for the, the new the new guys. I didn't want to like them because I don't want to have to make more models. Dang it, I've made enough ghouls in my life. But unfortunately, statistically, they're, they're currently make way too much sense if you're summoning a block of 20 from your arch region. My thoughts and prayers for you having to force and buy more models. Uh, literally, after this call ends, I've got to go up to the game store and go pick up my uh, my more trogs. I need to go buy some more trogs. Yeah, that's uh, a rough life to to need all these 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 plastic dolls. I'll tell you. Damn, threatening me with a good time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, um, cool. caveat here, folks. Um, so Josh is going to go through three examples of lists that he's built. These are not uh, the ultimate lists. Uh, so no. you don't have to take this and run this at a tournament. Um, I, I will uh, preface as well that we are there's no FAQs just yet. And I know yeah. Josh and I were having a, a pretty robust debate before we started around more, what was it? Was it Mord Mordant? No, what was it? Um, which sub faction? Uh, the Nagash interaction. Oh, um, oh yeah, uh, it, it's um, it is Morgan. It is Morgan. Morgan. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so there is some rules interactions. We'll get to in a second. We'll talk a bit about it. But just if you're thinking about doing this weird combination, go talk to your TO to see sure. if they are a rules as written person or rules as intended, because it could be a very different play. But. Here's your first sure. one. It's a Hello Morn list, uh, Arch Regent with Hoarfrost, uh, Arch Regent Ghoul King, with, sorry, uh, Abhorrent Ghoul King with uh, Deranged Transformation, a Vargulf with the Flay Pendant. Um, if you're hearing weird noises, it's Josh is in the kitchen. Um, no, 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 it's okay. <laughs> it Add flavor to uh, it, it, maybe people think they're going crazy hearing voices. Um, it, it would work well with this particular video. Uh, the Ghoul King on Royal Zombie Dragon, which is the General, Grave Robber, uh, Corpus Fane Gauntlet, Razor Clawed Mount Trait, Flaming Weapon. You've also got the Crypt Haunt Courtier, two, three units of horrors, four units of horrors, um, uh, all wrapped up under the overshadowed Grand Strategy Battle Regiment Warlord. What's this list? What does it do? How does it work? So this is this is not how I like to play Flesh Eater Courts. This is how, this is a way of playing Flesh Eater Courts, and this is like a, a threat or a pressure list. And the idea is that we're leveraging Holomorn, and we're leveraging the natural efficiency from horrors um, to let us run in charge with our horrors, 
And um, so this is not what this is not an alpha list. This is a pressure list, which means you get up in the enemy's deployment zone, turn one or turn two, and you basically try and pin them there for as long as possible um, while you run around score points for three or four turns, and then hopefully point them um, point out and win. So the way that this would look like from a deployment is you're a five drop. Um, you could also run this 100% without the warlord and run it as a, a battle reg. Um, a double battle reg for a two drop. Uh, that, that might be much better. As far as the grand strategy goes, pick one. I don't know what's the best one right now. I haven't played enough to know. But the, the idea here is that our six blocks of horrors are going to run and charge and head straight in. Mm. Um, you're going to get the Vargo of Courtier in range of a couple of those blocks with the intent being to provide multiple attempts at reroll charges. That's what that artifact does within um, an aura. You get a free reroll charge. So, you know, our whole line is going to threat saturate, move forward. We're going to use our summons to go ahead and pressure different portions of the board. And then we are going to go ahead and position the zombie dragon to come in the next turn, hopefully getting off its its reroll all wounds aura, which is a big increase in just general damage again on these war scrolls. So, so move up that Vargulf in the center zone, move up the dragon in the center zone, and then push all those horrors into the enemy line. Uh, a friend tried this and said it was absolutely terrible. So... <laughs> Ter but terrible in a corn. good way or in a bad way she was playing against corn and it yeah, just okay. it was not uh they were they, it's corn so they said cool thanks for coming to me and they had a big grind out fight and then the corn player ended up getting to summon stuff and just kind of won the game so um so i think it still has a lot of chops for most lists but be advised corn's corn's a rough one for this one <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, melee versus melee, corn has got some tricks. I think the interesting piece here is that your Crypt Horrors are getting so many benefits on the charge, right? So their War Scroll innatively gets some things when they charge. Hollow Morn, um, through the Shattering Charge ability, the reroll ones are to wound, is, fa is fascinating on the charge. You Obviously, your General on the charge does some mortal wounds. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that are really rewarding you to be on the charge, so... Um, uh, yeah, it's like that's why I was saying maybe this is better as a double battle reg because you're going to go and push. You want to go first or you want to go second, right? You'll make yeah. that call on on deployment. The other thing as well, which is fascinating, is um, <laughs> I was just looking at Wapedia just like as make sure I remember what I remember at all. And I'm like, why do I have to take a command trait and an artifact? Like, oh, that's right. That's how the game used to be. Everyone had to have their first artifact as their sub faction. So. Who knows? Welcome what's to 2017. Happen. Yeah. <laughs> it, it took me a second. I'm like, what? Why do I have? Why are you telling me to take my first artifact? But um, it'll be, it'll be fascinating when you get the new update and I actually get a new book. What actually happens? And um, although, like, to be fair as well, like mount traits seem to be disappearing in a lot of books. So who knows if that stays? Um, but you know, like I think you know, Josh, you mentioned as well. You know, you could double re you could reinforce these horrors, so you could bring them from four to three. You know, if you wanted to double in and double down on those crypt horrors, you could potentially drop that Ghoul King on on Zombie Dragon, find a few more foot heroes, and put more of those points into horrors. This is the the benefit, right? You can play around with it. You do you, build your list. This this I it like it. Yeah, and then, then for anyone who's never, and a lot of people are going to see this and be like, what, no terror guys? Get out of here. You don't know what you're doing. Um, go do the math. All says go do the math on a zombie dragon with uh, razor clawed and with flaming weapon. And, you know, remember to add in your, your plus one from finest hour for the wound. If you've got the hoarfrost ability, you can go ahead and make it so he hits on twos, wounds on threes. Um, the, the amount of damage that you can push out from a zombie dragon is much more then you would you would assume if you hadn't had this combo of stuff go off for you because i used to be super down on it everyone was they were like z dragon sucks terror guys where it's at um this series of 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 the 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 razor clawed plus flaming weapon particularly with hoarfrost making you maybe hit on twos um or go to three ap you know depending on whatever you want or three ren sorry depending on whatever you want to do is the potential for a, a truly staggering amount of damage um equal to a terror geist at least um just some of it not being mortals which i think in this edition might actually be bad because i that, think a lot of people might be teching into it or resistance that, to mortals yeah that was good yeah it's people are looking at mortal resistance so in one way missing those claws and especially when you spike with the claws and you can do 18 mortal wounds you you really notice you got a terror geist but um 
the zombie dragon's always been more utility. Um, yeah. Terror guys always been more smash. It's like, what do you want? Yeah. So, so yeah. So we'll move on into the next version of the list. I think, unless there's anything else you. No, okay. no, yeah, no. Is, I was, was, was going to ask you the same question. Like, is, is, yeah. is that all you want to talk about? Um, so this is this is my t my initial schwack at, at attempt for a Morgant list. Um, so again, Morgant uh, on a four up um, as a command trait. Excuse me, a command ability on a four up. You can return one of these ghouls that dies of these school units that dies. So um, you're looking at 80 ghouls and four blocks of 20, um, and then. You're also looking at the Arch Regent summoning 20 Royal Ghouls. So we're at 100 there. And then our Ghoul King summons uh, another 10. So we're at 110 Ghouls, reliably turn one, um, 30 of which can basically be deep struck anywhere on the board. Um, and then we also have a Zombie Dragon to go ahead and summon a Courtier with him. So you'll have another Vargulf there as well. So if you want, you can kind of set it up as a block over here of 30 Ghouls with a Vargulf, providing that bonus. And then your 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 ghast and your dragon kind of operating as a second one if you want kind of that two front two hammer type approach to an army. But I think that um, the real the real advantage on this one is again you're going to play it like a mid board, right? You're going to move these ghouls up. You're going to say, hey, come to me, and the enemy will come in, and they are going to absolutely shellac forty ghouls, right? And you're hoping that you return one of them. It's a four up. I know. It's a four up. I know. But you're hoping on some of these over the game, you're going to return a couple of these. And just the basic glow up on some of these war scrolls means that you hit a little bit harder than you ever thought you would before. So again, your counter punch should be pretty spicy. Um, and particularly the K, you've, you've, you've got, again, you're on a five drop, which I think five drop is going to be a really solid number to be where you are out dropping a lot of lists. But yes, you're never going to out drop the two, you know, the double battle reg peoples. But you will still outdrop a lot of lists. And what that means is that you get to determine whether or not you're probably throwing in that Terror Geist turn one um, and disjointing the enemy, um, or whether you're going to play extremely mid board, extremely castly, and let the guy come to you and then threat saturate and have everything going. So uh, they both play very similarly. Do you find Flesh Eater Courts doesn't generally care about going first, going second? Or are you making a deliberate choice here through Warlord that you need the extra spell or the artifact? Um, and that's why you're trading off like battle reg. Yeah. So, I mean, these are the decisions to make, right? So in this case, I don't even think I put it on here. The reason I went warlord was specifically just so I could take a lore, right? I could just take a spell lore. And again, these, these, these are super flexible because of the spell lore. Um, they're super flexible for what all your wizards get to do during the game. And, uh, these are just kind of shells, I would say for anyone to look at. Um, I don't. I do think the Warlord is important because I'm finding I either want the extra mount trait or I want the, the spell lore and the artifact, particularly if you're going Morgaunt, you're going Hollow Morn, you're locked into one that you don't want. Hmm. Um, so I'm finding that the Warlord gives you the flexibility. Again, look at your own kind of play style or the people who are playing around you. Sorry, there's everyone moving in the background. Uh, it's all, all good. It's all good. Uh, yeah. So, I'm so in a different country right now, so... Something that I'm playing with, and I don't know if it's correct, but I want to play with it, is um, mm -hmm. I've been taking Warlord in my Gits army because I've got a lot of, like, four, five wound idiot wizards. Um, yeah. I'm trying Warlord with extra spell. So instead of choosing spell law versus, like, Hoarfrost, Rupture, and things like that, I can do both. Sure. I can choose one of yeah. each, and I I'm fine. I'm going to test it and see the, the theory because there's a couple of really good spells that I want, but I yeah. don't want to leave home with that Hoarfrost. I don't want to leave home, home with that merciless blizzard and, and I don't me, have enough wizards to, to, to do both. Yeah. And I, for me, I want two guys to have it right for like Horfrost because like, I want them to go in. I want to use four primal dice on that guy. I'm fine with my little, you know, zombie or sorry, my, um, my, my ghoul King, you know, on turn five or, you know, turn four blowing himself up completely to go ahead and secure that final battle tactic or something. Um, that's what I see is probably a thing. And the other thing for the warlord that, that just from experience of playing the army for a long time is if I deploy and the enemy is going to go ahead and give me turn one, I, a lot of times I'll put my ghoul King, uh, my terror guys down last. And it, if I, I'll have made sure that I've made that I've given myself the ability to put the terror guys online up front, and the number of times where someone assumes that even telling them like, "Hey, man, it's a 20-inch threat range, turn one, um, plus charge," like even telling someone that they don't assume that you're going to throw away a threat piece that's that important 
turn one where I do it all the time. Like I've won a whole bunch of games, not because it's a terror gas and it's the best and it killed all kinds of stuff, but it disrupts the enemy's tempo so aggressively that if you do it correctly, where you put it into the wing of an army and it gets into some important targets, it's a threat that must be answered and that wastes an entire turn. They're going to kill it. That's fine. But it wastes an entire turn for them to have to go kill this thing and they never got to move out of the deployment zone. So I need the Warlord because in that situation, I don't want to waste my summon and I don't have enough CP to guarantee everything else working. So what I mean by that is, let's say, I've got my Terrorgeist on the front line and I've said, go ahead, give me turn one. I know that I can make this charge, you know, on a five inch charge or whatever. Um, I need the three CP from the four, the Warlord turn one. I don't want to burn the option of getting the extra CP because I want a Finest Hour. So I'm Finest Houring my Terrorgeist. I then have... Um, one CP, that's for my auto six. Um, I need one CP to summon, and I need one CP uh, as a reserve to go ahead and reroll a charge. Um, so so I need I need that Warlord 100% of the time um, on that turn one situation um, that if you don't have a Warlord, you, you, you can't do. So you're either deciding to not take the auto six, to risk no reroll, or to not summon your flayer, uh, your, your, um, yeah, your flayers somewhere on the board. And that's not a great, None of that's a good situation to 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 have. Um, so that's the reason the warlord, I guess, for me is is yeah, it's cool to get the thing, but honestly, it's it's half of it's just the extra CP for that situation that I find myself in very commonly. Yeah, I never I never remember that CP. I swear, I probably forget it more than it's I remember it. I I have a little people, triumph I, card. I have a little card for triumph. I'm like, cool. I remember my triumph. I need a free CP warlord. Like just my warlord CP. It's, 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 I'm telling you that little instance, right, of knowing it. And there's so many games that I realize, you know, turn five, and I'm certainly not unique in this, where you realize like turn five, you're like, oh my, I had a free CP that I could have just said I needed. Or you always remember it when it's like the charge phase. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you're like, why didn't I say I needed the CP in the hero phase? So, yep, yep, yep. Yeah. I like it. I think it's uh, yeah, cool, interesting. Um, something that I'm playing around with as well is, um, and, I, and you might be able to play with this too, is the um, the acolyte battalion. The uh, on a three plus, you get yourself the extra primal magic dice, and because I and like you know having that extra dice, and it could be the difference. Like if people are using primal dice to unbind, which it seems like the theme is going to be more anti magic mm -hmm. than magic having an advantage of having one more dice above your opponent to get that critical spell off or to, to burn yeah. it, to, to unbind and then still have something up your sleeve um, yeah. could be a valuable tool. It's something that I'm playing with. I don't have an answer yet, but it's something I'm, I'm, I'm exploring. The, the one thing that I didn't include in this list and I tried to come up with a good version um, that I really wanted to include is I really wanted to include the wizard slaying battalion particularly for ghouls because they go from two attacks to three attacks base against a wizard how often will that come up probably not very often it's probably not that useful but i really felt like man wouldn't it be cool if i could fit this in and i never could come up with a good way of fitting it in but i urge you it's in there somewhere i'm telling you right now just for free slap if you don't need the low the low drops I, I struggle to work out where I needed it. I'm like, yeah. unless I'm going into like a, a wizard hero, like an Archaeon, a Mar no, Marathi. Marathi's not a wizard. Um, sure. A little, little Marathi. Like, uh, I mean, obviously like Sentinels and Wardens. I'm like, there's certain things. That's what there, I was thinking was like, Lumineth. But even then, like. Yeah. like I, I literally was thinking even, Lumineth. But like, do you, is it even worth it? And because it's only really one model that's the wizard. The rest of the unit's not the wizard. So I pulled away from yeah. it. I'm going to be honest, it's one of those things where, like, I, I am a, one of the huge gaps, right, in my wargaming uh, education or whatever is that I'm a feck player and I don't play other factions um, very much in, in AOS. I do in 40k, but not really in, in AOS. So for me, I'm always like, well, hey, I'm the good guys. The bad guys are always doing tricky stuff like that, when in fact, it's just I don't understand the keyword interactions. Uh, I'm like, ah, yeah, they're all wizards, you know, get in there, boys. <laughs> At the moment... I don't think it's worth it, but yeah, let's see how it's the fun. meta shift. Let's see what happens. Let's see. And if you're not on a top table, um, definitely playing playing the fun good guys, trying to hunt some wizards is a is a way to theme your army for for justice and 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 for good. So, well, it's a quest. It's a, a quest of the of from the realm. The quest of the realms. 
So, oh yeah, here we go. Fi- the Here's final the list. list. The final list. And as we said right at the start, um, there is a errata FAQ that has to come sometime because yeah. there is a there is rules as written versus rules as intended. I'm going to pass it, the mic over to you, Josh, and yeah. you can explain so, some of the crack science. I'm just going to say, don't. First off, I'm going to say, just generally speaking, I would play this with friends. I personally wouldn't bring this to a tournament. Um, even, I mean, obviously, talk to your TO, and your TO might say that this is totally fine. We're going to cover the rules interaction um, in a second. But it definitely is not, it doesn't feel like it's rules as intended, um, and it, it needs an FAQ. But the short answer, the, the short thing here is we're back into Morgan as a sub faction. So when a unit, uh, when a surface unit dies, you can go ahead and spend the CP and do that four up. Um, and hopefully you bring the unit back. But the wording on that rule is set up a new unit yes. onto the battlefield. A, a new identical unit. So it's the command ability that yep. comes from Morgon. So outside of Morgon, you can't use this. So it's a command ability when the surf unit dies. So the, the surfs are just Just ghouls. ghouls. Just, just ghouls. ghouls. So yep. on, a, on, a, on a four plus, um, the, uh, a new identical unit from the one that was destroyed is added to your army. And then you summon it from a board edge, basically outside of nine, within right. six inches of the board edge. And you can only use this once per phase. Correct. So so you get your one shot every time one of these 30-man blocks dies. You're like, oh, big rolls here, boys. Got to make the four up, right? So you, make the, you, you hopefully make the four up. Whether you make the four up or don't make the four up, um, Nagash's War Scroll has a very similar mechanic on a three up, but it says for a unit that has been destroyed. It doesn't say this phase. It doesn't say there's no, uh, I guess, parameter. At least I don't remember a parameter um, for that. It's just a unit that has been destroyed um, I'm, in I'm, your I'm, beginning I'm, of your hero I'm, phase. I'm pulling it up now. So yeah. uh, the Sup- Supreme Lord of the Undead, at the start of your hero phase, you can pick one friendly summonable mordant uh, Ossiak Bone Reapers with a wounds characteristic of three or less that's been destroyed. Roll a dice on a three plus a new replacement unit with half the models from that unit that was destroyed rounding up. Basically, rules as written, you, you can do both. You could double. Yeah, you could rules, double rules kind of as return in, units. Rules as intended, probably not. So if you probably think not. about this, either A, don't go buy Nagash if you don't already own a Nagash, B, Correct. Speak, to tor- speak, to, speak to your tournament organizer. Unless you use the affiliate code, feel free to go buy all the net caches you want from, <laughs> from one of my affiliate partners. But uh, look, it's a fun interaction. Let's see if it survi- let's see if GW survives it. But let's assume yeah. that it does. What's what's going on here? What's going on here is the idea that we're just going to castle around Nagash. We're going to go and have fun with our big boy Nagash model, and we're going to try and uh, leverage, um, you know, both having three wizards in this case, because I took the Arcane Tome on my little baby courtier, which is super silly, I acknowledge, but it's the only way I could come up with to get all three endless spells on the board every turn if I wanted to. Um, You'll also notice that there's no... This is the first time I've ever gotten to take gr- gr- uh, Growing Kingdom too, which is that you have more summoned units at the end uh, than you started with. Uh, or something similar to that. It's like our silliness, the silliness that we never get to take because it's a it's a terrible battle ta- uh, uh, grand strategy. Okay. So this is like this is memes to the max. It's it's the grand strategy no one will ever take. It's the gash breaking the game with with questionable rules lawyering. It's the ultimate in in memory from Feck. Um, is it good? No. Will it occasionally frustrate people? A hundred percent. Um, and it's funny. So it made the list for me. Um, I, I would just, as a note though, and kind of one of the reasons I wanted to include this list is you'll notice that even though you're like, oh, you're running these Morgant lists, why aren't you running the Chalice of Ushran, right? Um, which is like an obvious choice. You're running you're running ghouls. You have to run the Chalice, aren't, don't you? And the answer is, I would love to. I just don't think it'll ever do much other than the turn it gets, the turn it gets summoned. And maybe that's worth it. But you are always giving your opponent a free battle tactic. Um, hundred percent of the time. So you have to basically make the decision of, at least the way that I've been looking at it is either you're going to run like three endless spells because you're going for a wizard list or you're going to run zero endless spells because mm. you're always going to give your enemy an extremely easy battle tactic of dispel an endless spell. Right. Um, and, and that's the, that's the reason you, you don't, you don't see the chalice on my list. It's just because I looked at it. I was like, man, I want nothing more than to run the chalice into these, these ghoul lists. And it just feels bad to give someone a free, 
battle tech uh, yeah battle tactics so yeah it, it feels like and you know let's watch the competitive it landscape for the next month or two to see kind of where we land right. it feels like everyone's going heavier to anti-magic than to go into magic and because of those concerns i i've done that as well like i've dropped a lot of my endless spells i've even i've even kind of like revisited the cron spine i'm like you know do i bring in the cron spine sure. and i think the reality is, is there's a lot of people going anti-tech is it worth it? Like, is it going to be enough endless spells to go eat? Probably not. Um, the points is 500 points. Um, there's obviously now battle tactics and grand strategies and things that are tied with it. Right. I just, I, and then, the, then you got the likes of corn that just go sh straight up. No. So sure. Like, sure. Um, but, but to, to get to the three that I chose here, you can pick the ones you want. The Umbra spell portal is the obvious choice, just so you can get within that three inch range to do, I think it's finger of dust or hand of dust, whatever the, yeah. the auto kill a model is, um, which is like, that's the reason why you're playing the gash, right? Cause he's super cool and you can absolutely merc somebody. Um, never played it. I hope, I mean, I hope this is a fun list, right? Uh, but generally speaking, yeah, I'm just, I'm concerned about endless spells as a whole. And um, I'll also say that one of my guys will always take the anti uh, uh, cron spine spell in the new lore, uh, just for you. So I'll, I'll always take spell lore, and one of my guys will have that automatically turn off a cron spine or make him wild, um, just just for you, just for you. Oh, it, it'll be interesting to see how the. It, it's an interesting spell, especially if you take the the general command trait that allows you to know all the spells from the lore yeah. of Antor. Cause I, I wouldn't pick rupture as my first spell. It's like For my sure. third, of, but having it up your sleeve in those situations where you can turn a predatory endless spell into predatory or turn it a cron spine to go wild um, will it's pay funny. dividends. It will pay dividends, but you're going to find a lot of situations where you can't use it. So don't make it your yeah. first, like S super techie. It's cool to have, but and it'll be hilarious when it happens that one time. That's what I'll say. Yeah, but but what's more hilarious is four d six mortal wounds. <laughs> That's why. As long as you use every primal dice you have and blow up your own wizard at the same time, I think that's a that's a good trade that everyone can be happy with. Look, if you roll two d six and roll a one, and then you add an extra primal dice, you ask for it. You de you deserve a primal you do. miscast. Like, and I will do it every time. So, uh, I love it. Um, oh my god, I've, my, I've got a chest infection, a massive chest infection. I'm about to go into a coughing fit. You're um, a champion. I'm, yeah. I'm laughing. I'm laughing my backside off. But <laughs> there I go. There it is. There it is. Nice. I held it off. For, I held it off for 90 minutes, and then bloody Nagash and <laughs> friends triggered me. But like when I look at this, so like after talking to you and looking at these rules. On behalf of like as a like a, a ghoul's aspiring ghoul player, I'm not committed to the army, but I do play it and I do enjoy yeah. it. And I've got I've got many, 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 many models. Um hell, I was I was on Games Workshop website with my little ghoul king on his little um little chair. Um, so cute. He was cool. I was really cool. Like I feel That's more cool, positive about flesh eater courts with these updates. Like like, yeah, I lost some things with the flayers, and I think I'll miss the mortal wounds because you've got some rend. You've got some good rend, yeah. But the thing that you lack is mortal wounds, especially ranged mortal wounds. And overall, the flayers will have more utility, but you have lost something that it brought to the table. In saying yeah. that, the ghouls, the horrors, um, some of the other things that have been brought to the table, I'm feeling that you gained more than you lost. Is that kind sure, of sure. like the, the fair assumption? Yeah. I do. I think the you generally gain more than you lost on pretty much any war scroll type situation, um, and it'll really be dependent on your ability to deploy well in a wizard heavy meta, um, to to really still operate the way that flesh eater courts was supposed to operate. Um, what I'll say just generally though, as far as like the army as a whole, is that uh, much like any army, right? You should fall in love with them because of the lore and because of like the the things that make you want to play the army and to me um the lore of the army is is only going to get cooler and better you got a new book on the way you've got um you know probably hopefully a new model range coming right and if not it's one of the best kit bash fun model lines of all time because you can take those old bretonian models and put skeleton bodies in them and and have fun 
I so. kit bash the hell out of mine on my, uh, my flayers have little flags that like go across the That's bones, awesome. like in the That's spine. What I'm um, my ghouls, I've got like a, like a musician and a standard bearer. Um, I even, cause I've, I've got more money than like dollars than cents. Um, <laughs> I bought, I, I bought a white King on foot. I cut yeah. off its head, put it on top of my ghoul King. So it actually had a crown. That's cool. Now, like, yeah. I mean, like it's an expensive conversion. Now GW actually brings out a model with a crown, but like sure, it sure. is so much, it's so much fun. And, um, I do hope that you get your more talk. Like, give me sure. Shoran. If that comes, I will be such a happy little player because um, that's probably the one thing you're missing is like a centerpiece. You are. Give me a named hero, centerpiece, yeah. someone to to muster the force. And maybe they're inspired by the new cities of Sigmar and something very knightly, very bretonier very, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think um, I'll say too, I've had a lot of fun with, with this concept of like, you know, just being AOS being AOS, right? You're like, hey, you do your theme for your particular realm that your army is operating in. And I think that there's a lot of fun lore for when you're going to make your army or model your army on, hey, who was this army? Like what other faction was this before it became Flesh Eater Courts? So you can kind of take and repurpose literally any faction in the game and make it into a Flesh Eater Courts faction that, it, excuse me, that exists in that side or that realm. Um, so it's, it's, it's one of the best for modeling in the game, hands down. It's got amazing lore. All right, well, I'm Don't not letting I'm, I'm not letting you go until you tell me yours. So, what is your your lore? Inspire the masses here. That if people haven't <laughs> developed their own lore and found their spot in the mortal realm, where what's yours? Yeah, all about? so so my I have um, two different blocks that I painted in my army at two different times. So uh, my my first portion of painting was all. Um, modeled after a series of waterlogged shayish based um pale blue um ghouls and so they were uh cast out from shayish they ended up finding a basically fighting towards a uh, realm gate and finding a realm gate deciding that they were in a land of um of, of evil and needing to go out there and quest amongst the realms and find a new safe place for themselves they ended up making it through a portal into gur um, and so the other half of my army is all like a tribal uh, headhunter vibe. So all of my models have like heads that they're carrying um, and they're much more of a bestial vibe and they're all much more uh, blue green to kind of represent the the difference and change of uh, them being like a forest kind of base thing. So I've got my, my old original uh, start of the crusade knights that are all uh, blue and kind of like an ice blue vibe. Um, and then the transition to what they have picked up, their new friends that they've picked up, which is uh, several tribes, basically of gigantic horror, uh, like headhunters, because we had headhunters in that particular league. So that was the lore for, for my particular crusade as it came into Gur um, and has begun to spread the good word uh, amongst the local populace that um, Ushran is here and he cares. Sounds like you need this marrow scroll. You need this marrow scroll hell of walking <laughs> around. But um, if people yeah. wanted to see your mod, this, by the way, sounds incredible. I, I love I love anyone who is able to incorporate some lore into their army. It does unlock. I've talked about this a few times, but it really does unlock conversion, stories, uh, hobby inspiration. There's so many cool things you can do when you, like, you start playing with this space. But if people wanted to follow you, if they want to see some of your hobby, um, are you on Twitter or threads or discord or where, where can I Not find really. your stuff? I can, I'll, I'll send you maybe a picture or two. You can throw on the, maybe the link for the YouTube, but it's, it'll just be a picture right. or two. I'm not a, I'm not a top tier painter, but I, 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 I will say that, um, I do a lot of 3D printing, a lot of modifying. Cool. But, uh, you still but yeah. there? Sorry. You, you cut, you, sorry. Nope. I don't, I don't oh. know if you cut out on All my right. side, but can you just repeat it just I'm, in case it was. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I'm not a, uh, I'm not a, a, an Instagrammer much, but I'll, I'll send you a picture to maybe you can throw a link up or something uh, on the video. But yeah, no, I'm not a painter, but I love that space. So, awesome. Any final advice you'd want to give me as a flesh eater court player, or do you reckon like? Don't don't ever sleep on feast day, the the sub faction feast day. Um, if your feast day is the most forgiving of all the sub factions, so if you're struggling and you find that your CP use is like not necessarily the best and you kind of just want to do stuff then look into feast day because it's very forgiving and you can make just really general lists um 
that, that are forgiving as a player. And then two, um, my main piece of advice is just have a have a deployment set that you know you can always rely on this one basic way of putting down your models because when you go up to play and you don't know what the other guy does, you can kind of ask him what he does, but you're never really going to know what he does until he does them to you. Um, so having a good deployment plan and knowing kind of like how you deploy in most of the battle plans you're going to play will just save you flat out from just throwing some games away where you just kind of deploy it all willy-nilly and you didn't know what you were doing and it, it bit you. All right, fi final question because you forced my hand. What's yours? Like, now, obviously, battle yeah. plans, opponents, going first, going second, there's all these things that are going to happen. Yeah. But, like, what advice would you give me as a Flesh Eater Courts player deployment? Are you someone who deploys on the line? Are you someone who, like, centers up castles? Yeah. Are you like, ha Give me your baseline. Generally speaking, Generally speaking, I'm going to have um, my screens and my blo my blocking formations, which for me in the past, it was like two nine blocks of horrors. But for this, it'll be almost the same for my feast day list moving forward, um, which is going to be six, six and nine. So those are going to be uh, pretty centrally located, probably on the line. Um, I'm going to have my throne put out actually as a blocking piece most of the time. So it's not even really about her getting onto the throne. Sorry, it's a her for me. I have a, a female little archery gent. Uh, cool. But... Um, so I'll have her hop on the throne at a later turn. She won't start in the throne. That was a common mistake I had when I was starting to play. Um, I'll use the throne as a as a physical blocking piece um, when I deploy. And then the idea being that I'm trying to figure out where are those wizards going, and I'm trying to make sure that I'm in a space where they're behind, outside of 30, um, from the from the forwardmost point that I think the enemy will deploy, so that I'm guaranteed to get at least one turn of pretty much uninhibited spell casting. And I will always give myself the most, the forward most position of my deployment zone towards the enemy, the ability to then set the terror guys down right in front of it, um, usually in front of my line, even away from people, uh, but within 24 inches for ferocious hunger. Um, if you kind of like do those measurements out, you can kind of reliably fit kind of your wizards in the back, all your strip line, uh, your, your, your bulk units up front and within 10 of your courtiers. And then you make sure to give yourself one one spot to drop a terror guys right on the front line in case the enemy looks like that they're deploying in a way where you're e easily able to do it and what it'll force them to do often is they have to take turn one because they realize that they screwed up their deployment and if if they allow you to just freely put a terror guys in the backfield of their army that's really bad for them so it'll force them sometimes to just take turn one and sometimes that wins you the game i find as yeah. a terror guys player uh, the psychology of a terror geist in deployment is enough to throw it's people the off. It's the threat. Yeah. I remember, I remember the old, um, back in the old legions of Nagash, um, I used to run a terror geist in legion of night and it used to be able to put up to three units into ambush. So the fear of a an ambushing terror guys, because it was always cool. my last, the last thing I could deploy and I was like, am I going to airbush you? Am I going to come from front? Like mm -hmm. that threw people off uh, so yeah. often. So um, they just yeah. think of like, I'm going to do 18 mortal wounds. They say it's like 18 mortal wounds and is coming at me. Dude, it happens sometimes, but it's so rare. It's so rare that the terror guys actually punches to like what people think it will. So it's it's almost a threat piece more than it is anything else. I mean, it's an extremely threat piece, right? It's, it's that distraction card effects, but it's, it's a, um, yeah. It, it'll do it for you every once in a while. When it does, man, does it feel great slash terrible for that other guy? <laughs> hey, rip, 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 rip. I've ripped so many KO balloons apart with 18 mortal wounds. Like, oh, you got an Arcanaut. Yeah. See you later. That's but cool. This is, Sorry. This, is, <laughs> this has been awesome. I think you and I could talk forever. You've got a kitchen going to be much. full up, full of uh, full of peeps. <laughs> I've got to go pick up some trogs. Um, is there any <laughs> shout outs? Any people you want to say hello to? G'day, welcome. Uh, um, or go on. Wrap, yeah. wrap, wrap us up. Yeah, so uh, to, to my personal gaming club, uh, hello to you all, um, the Sunburst Standard. And then um, to the Colorado team, actually, the Colorado scene uh, for having the best Flesh Reader Court scene that I've seen anywhere uh, so far in the States, at least. So shout out to you guys and, of course, to, to my lady, Jenna. Nice. Thanks for letting me do this, babe. <laughs> you, you, you sound delusional, but that keeps to the Always. theme of the show. But if you enjoyed it, let me know. Comment section, you know the dealio. Um, let me know in the comment section as well. Um, maybe there is something about the Herald that I'm sleeping on. Josh and I can't work it out. Maybe it's something that's going to help us in the new battle tone when it hits, mm -hmm. and maybe there's something coming. But right now, 
I'm not connecting the dots. But either way, let us know in the comments. Josh, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this discussion and I hope Flesh Eater Courts players, you're feeling a little bit more inspired and you've got some new ideas on how you can make the most of the new war scrolls and uh and if for you sure. are a flesh eater gods player in my discord i've got an awesome active server uh jump in and chat to all you grand delusional ghoul kings and serfs but not, not you're all knights and serfs you <laughs> all right i'm about to i'm thanks, about to have yes. a coffee fit <laughs> thanks everyone i hope you enjoyed it bye i think skin bye Thanks for hanging around until the end. I hope you enjoyed that video and you walked away with a few new ideas. Now, if you did, I would love it if you press like on the video, as well as left me a comment with your thoughts. The conversation will continue over on Discord and the link is down below in the episode description. I also want to give a massive shout out to the AOS Coach patrons and YouTube members who are supporting the channel and the growth that you're seeing here. So cheers, you are all bloody legends. And until next time, don't roll a double one on a spell cast.